So because of this, where leveling is pretty much mandatory. And by where leveling, I mean when I write a block, I have to pick a block that's not worn out that much. And if I read it too many times, I have to sort of pick it up and reprogram it fresh again in a new cell such that I can start you know, my read disturbance um, uh, thing all over again. And where leveling is pretty much mandatory nowadays, and it's kind of expensive. If I have a terabyte worth of flash that I developed in 4K, that I track in 4K pages, that's 256 million 4K pages that I have to track. Say, like, I'm relatively modest about how I do this, and I only have, say, a 64-bit word for every one of these 4K pages to do my wear leveling. That means I've got two gigabytes worth of a, essentially, remapping table that I have to track for this one terabyte. So. You actually have to have a decent amount of DRAM sitting in these flash controllers to handle this sort of wear leveling. Not only that, because I have to move data, not because I've just written data, but because I've read it too many times, this causes what's called write inflation, which means I didn't actually write any data per se, but just the act of accessing the device has caused me to have to pick up the data and write it again somewhere else, and this is called write inflation. And there went a lot of your um, performance, because remember from the previous slide, programming takes a really long time, you know, one and a half milliseconds on next generation devices. And then on top of this, these things are not necessarily as persistent as one would assume. Near the end of a rated life of a device, you can expect anywhere from three months to a year worth of retention at room temperature, which is like crazy. You know, you, you have disk drives sitting on your shelf for a while and you plug them back in. You don't expect the bits to have gone anywhere. But with a um, NAND device, it's like if you've programmed to erase that thing a good number of times, three months from now, your bits may not be there anymore. That's kind of frightening and of course needs to be managed appropriately. Of course then going back to our storage um, ingredients and recipes, the other thing here is interconnects. You have all your favorite ones of today, SAS, SATA, Fiber Channel, all of those are your typical uh, storage things, very good for transferring blocks reliably from point A to point B, all with pluses and minuses that I've listed there. Ethernet of course is uh, very ubiquitous. It's cheap, it's fast. Unfortunately, when the going gets tough, Ethernet starts dropping packets. Not exactly what you were looking for in your reliable storage transport. InfiniBand, of course, with its forward, backward, congestion management, flow control, solves all these problems, but, and yes, it's fast, but it's also very expensive. It's reliable, but it's pretty much a niche market. It's not going to be you know, installed on your laptop or your desktop anytime in the near future, most likely. And then, of course, there's uh, PCI Express, sort of the overlooked uh, interconnect, I would say, for doing this sort of stuff. It's fast, very deterministic, very cheap, well integrated in the CPU root complex. Unfortunately, no one's really done much with PCI Express in terms of using it as a transport outside the box or as an interconnect at the rack level, sort of an untested area. But I think because of Fusion IO and a lot of other people in the industry, we're going to start seeing a movement in this direction because it is so well integrated with uh, CPUs and operating systems that you almost can't pass it up. You know, PCI Express Gen 3 is uh, a gigabyte a second per lane. So if I have a 4X PCI uh, Express card, that's four gigabytes a second I can get off this thing. That's, you're starting to talk real bandwidth real quick. Uh, a little bit uh, more about Ethernet here is that really no native storage protocols uh, live on top of it. Sorry, ATA over Ethernet, I don't really count that. Um, uh, if you have a congested network, as I mentioned before, Ethernet starts to get droppy, which means you have timeouts and retransmits at higher levels in the stack, which just leads to non-deterministic behavior. It's really kind of unfortunate. Um, going back to the speed of all this, when we made the transition from 100 megabit to gigabit Ethernet, that was during this CPU clock speed race. Sure, initially when 1 gigabit Ethernet came out, people needed TCP offload engines, all this interesting stuff so the CPUs could keep up. Pretty soon the CPUs themselves got fast enough to where now saturating a gigabit, it's like, yeah, your cell phone could probably do that. It's just not, it doesn't take a lot of CPU power to transfer 100 megabytes a second. 
10 gigabit, however, which is you know now becoming increasingly popular, it's a little different story. We're not getting increasing clock rates. What we are getting is we're getting increasing parallelism. So that means in your Ethernet or your you know networking stack, you're fundamentally, in order to keep up with this, you either have to have the hardware do most of the work, which is the tow stuff, which is expensive, complex, and um, nobody ever seems to really like sticking there for very long. Or you have parallelism. You have to have a multi-threaded networking stack. Unfortunately, the existing networking stacks in most operating systems were not designed that way because they were designed back in the 90s when it was like, all right, we've got a relatively slow network. We'll just you know, have a single thread, big locks everywhere, and 10 gigabit Ethernet just fundamentally is going to require a lot of parallelism or a lot of multi-threading in your networking stack to keep up. So people are getting there, but it's still a little lagging the rest of the industry, I would say. Going back again to our recipe, we got a whole bunch of protocols. You have, essentially, I grouped them into four different levels here. You have your block level protocols, where you just say, give me this 4K page, or whatever your favorite page size is, write this 4K page. That's about the end of the expression you have. Now you're starting to be able to say, free this 4K page, and wow, you've increased the number of commands by 50%. Good job. Um, the, you also have a hash storage for essentially I give you a you know 256 bit 64 bit hash, you return me data associated with that hash. There's several examples there. Object storage is just again there's no namespace, there's no anything. I give you a 64 bit number. We start talking about a given object. It has a size. It has you know contents. It has its existence or non-existence. And of course, then sort of the highest level of all of these is file. This is one of most file systems, uh, talk, sys, NFS, all your favorite ones. And this is where you have not only the, the notion of objects or files, but you have the notion of directories, permissions, namespaces, all this sort of added level of complexity on top of all of this. So what do all these things mean in terms of all these storage ingredients mean when it comes to putting something together? Well, I think that looking forward, there are a lot of implications here, which is that disk drives are fundamentally bad at random IOPS. And guess what you have to do for metadata? I mean, the Luster guys have had to fight this in the high-performance computing industry for years. Is that keeping up with the number of operations per second of your metadata is just hard. It, there's a lot of them. So I think the trend that you're starting to see and will continue to see is that Flash will be used for your metadata store, because there you can get the IOPS that you need. And if your data size is modest, probably all all your data will be on Flash because the price is dropping to where that's a very reasonable thing to expect nowadays. Disk will start to be used just strictly for bulk or streaming data. Um, an interesting thing to note though is that since the cost of these disk drives continues to drop in terms of dollars per gigabyte, is that you're starting to see in you know Hadoop FS, um, you know Google's file system. Nobody's doing, starting to migrate, people are, I wouldn't say nobody's doing RAID anymore, people are starting to migrate uh, um, away from the traditional concept of, you know, RAID 5, RAID 6, because rebuild times are just getting um, enormous. If you go back to one of my previous slides, a doubling capacity means 40% more time to populate this device. That's if you're going at platter speed and doing nothing but sequential IOs to this device. If you're doing random IOs, well, essentially population time is getting close to infinite. So what this means is that when I have a drive that fails and I have to tie up all the other drives in the stripe to rebuild that one failed device, now I have a whole bunch of drives that are essentially useless in terms of doing customer workload. And they're useless for a very long time. You know, it can take days, sometimes weeks, to rebuild a, a single drive. That's why people are moving to double and triple parity rate. But because the cost of these things is dropping so much, I think you'll start seeing a move to simpler replication like mirroring or even three-way mirroring because the cost per gigabyte is getting so low for these things and the time to populate these is getting so bad that if I have a simple mirror, I can do a quick transfer. It's very easy. I only tie up one of my buddies. If I have a three-way mirror, I can do something real clever, like say I'm rebuilding drive A, using the contents of drive B, and servicing random IO with drive C, and everybody's happy. So there's, uh, I think, going to be a move to much simpler replication in the future, and, and RAID will continue to exist, but be pushed farther and farther um, away from the mainstream. 
And the other interesting thing is that we were talking about existing protocols before. All of those protocols have been around for a long time. They were designed in an era when access times were measured in multiple milliseconds, not tens of microseconds like they are today. So I think that you're, as you see, even with existing protocols, it just can't keep up with the raw capability of the hardware. You look at having a terabyte of flash, if you're doing reads, you can do hundreds of thousands of IOPS a second, perhaps even a million, at multiple gigabytes a second of um, transfer speed, even doing random I.O. That's a lot. And existing storage protocols that were designed to be in the kernel with a big lock protecting them for concurrency. I mean, even doing a system call from the application level, that's like close to a millisecond. That's a measurable percentage of the access time to your storage media now. Even doing a context switch to go into the operating system and grab a lock, poof, that's measurable now in terms of the latency to your underlying devices. So I think something's got to give here. The existing protocols need to be sort of rethought with um, all of these new constraints in mind, which I'll get to in more in a second. As I mentioned before, just checking rebuild is a problem. And we mentioned before about low latency, high bandwidth um, becoming necessary for um, potentially new storage protocols. PCI Express may become an option in terms of an interconnect in this regard. Sure, it'll probably initially only be rack level, but you know, Miracle Fiber Optic can extend it to the data center level. You'll probably start seeing more PCI Express switches out there. And this could be a very interesting option for transferring data at extremely high rates of speed for very low cost. High, the highest performance implies DRAM and flash. Because frankly, you know, disk drives aren't going to get you to that level of performance anytime soon. And um, for many applications, the ideal interface is not, you know, a complex file system with a weird namespace and all this access checking that you have to do that implies even more latency and more complicated software. But for a large number of applications out there, a simple object store or even hash store would be ideal. And if you were able to add transactions on there to be able to say slightly more complex things, that would be even better. So I think some of these ideas you'll start to see evolving over the next uh, uh, four or five years in the storage industry. Which brings us to inflection points. Anytime you have something, a, a complex system where enough variables change, it, it essentially means new opportunities rise. As a, uh, someone once said, 10% is better, but 10x is fundamentally different. And I think that we've seen a 10x um, change in a lot of variables in the last uh, uh, 10 years. In particular, the last time we had an uh, inflection point in the storage industry, I would uh, posit, is back around 2003. What happened then? Very interesting things, as a matter of fact. CPUs lost their front side bus. They all started, the memory controller became integrated. That means that as you scale the number of processors in a system, you are no longer constrained by you know, concurrent access to that limited resource, the front side bus. Now you could scale the memory bandwidth and memory capacity along with the number of sockets in your system. CPUs also got a lot more I.O. Opteron was the first CPU on the market that really exemplified this. You got to be able to scale. Now that you had the scalability in terms of CPUs and memory capacity and bandwidth, now you could also scale the I.O. SATA became ubiquitous, point-to-point -point interconnect, very fast. Drives uh, in around 2003 were starting to ship with SATA as the default. And what this meant is that with commodity components, you could build a very balanced, very high-performance um, storage system. And Thumper, or the Sun X4500, was sort of the very first one of these that I was aware of in the market that really took all of these concepts and pushed them forward. And Thumper was originally designed when, oh yeah, 2003. So this was really, I think, the last big inflection point in the industry was all these variables change, again, on the order of 5 to 10x from the previous generation, and you got some very interesting things happening with that. Now I think a very similar um, thing has happened in, now in 2010. CPUs have even more I.O. If you look at Intel's upcoming Sandy Bridge, a single socket of Sandy Bridge is going to have 40 PCI Express Gen 3 lanes on it. 
Remember, each lane of PCI Express Gen 3 is a gigabyte a second. So a single socket in I.O. bandwidth built in is going to have 40 gigabytes a second. I mean, holy cow. Imagine if you have a four-socket system. That's 160 gigabytes a second. Just insane amounts of I.O. And, of course, um, the memory and uh, quick the QPI interconnects is sort of scaled to go with that. So you're looking at more than a 10x difference in the previous generation in terms of the amount of I.O. you can force through one of these systems. 